Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And in this episode, I'm delighted to have my friend, colleague, and my coach, Brian Miner, on the show. And we're going to be talking all about progressive overload and some of the many nuances that are often overlooked, but very much integral to how we apply this principle in training, specifically for muscle growth and strength outcomes. For those of you who may not know, Brian is coming down under in just over 20 days for the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference here in Melbourne. So if you are in Australia or you may not be from Australia and want to come to see Brian talk about progressive overload, we still have tickets available. So VIP tickets are sold out, but we do have one, two, and three day passes. And the link for those is in the description box below. Brian will be presenting alongside Martin McDonald, Menno Henselman, Jeff Nippard, Eric Helms, Mike Isratel, James Krieger, James Hoffman, Danny Lennon, and Gabrielle Fundaro. So it's an absolutely star-studded lineup, guys, and we would love to see you there. Also, just a little bit more housekeeping before we get into things. Brian has contributed to our online mentorship course, and our next intake for that is beginning in September and enrollment is now open. So if you're a coach, you're a soon-to-be personal trainer, or maybe you're a fitness enthusiast who just wants to learn more to improve your own training and diet practices, be sure to check it out and we have you covered uh, from start all the way through to the end of the coaching process. We cover a quite diverse and very much applicable and relevant topics. So make sure you do check that out if you're interested. Without further ado, let's get into things. And here is Brian Miner talking all about progressive overload. So guys, welcome back to the JPS podcast. And we are here with Brian Miner. His beard is looking very lush today, much thicker than the last time we spoke. He's been uh, making some gains by the look of things. Brian, how you doing? Good, how are you? (laughs) I'm good, man. And for those of you who don't know, Brian is going to be coming to Australia in 23 days. Uh, I think 22, actually. Um, 23, maybe, of where Brian is, um, to present at the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference. And Brian is going to be talking about progressive overload and some of the nuances related to that uh, for hypertrophy. So, Brian, today we're going to talk about uh, everything related to progressing the stimulus for the goal of building muscle and I think first you know we should lay the foundations of what is the physiological objective for hypertrophy and then what does progressive overload mean for that like what do we need to achieve at a physiological level yeah so um, you know obviously with with hypertrophy I mean we first have to determine and get on the same page of you know what what is driving hypertrophy and this this is still this isn't totally cut and dry yet um you know it was proposed in 2010 in brad schoenfeld's paper the three mechanisms being uh mechanical tension metabolic stress and muscle damage and since then um you know more data has come out to to indicate you know at least that mechanical tension is the primary driver um and it could be metabolic stress is simply augmenting fiber recruitment, um, which we're then able to place mechanical tension on, and then muscle damage being a, a byproduct of uh, you know, placing tension or, and or mechanical, or sorry, metabolic stress. Um, so I, I guess most of my discussion is going to be based off of that backdrop, um, that mechanical tension is, is what's driving hypertrophy. And what I mean by driving, it's creating the anabolic cascade, you know, on the physiological level, it's, it's initiating that cascade that is tipping the scales in favor of protein synthesis exceeding breakdown, you know, across a 24 hour period or whatever period you're examining. Um, so, you know, that being said, you know, one of the questions you know that that is a hot topic is you know is is volume driving hypertrophy or is intensity driving hypertrophy 
And Jacob, I know, I know you and I have talked about this quite a bit in the past. It, it's, it's oftentimes just an issue of, you know, people not speaking the same language or, you know, operating off the same definition of, you know, what volume is. Um, and so with, with it in mind that mechanical tension is, you know, the, the stimulus that's creating this, this cascade, you know, we, we can think of volume for hypertrophy almost as like the, so, the total, the totality of tension that we're placing on high threshold fibers, which is, is what we can call like impulse. It's force times time of exposure. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we train, when we take a set to a, you know, either a set that's heavy enough or take it to a sufficient level of effort, we increase motor unit recruitment. Um, those fibers, you know, they actively contract, cross bridging occurs. They're generating force that's being opposed by the load on the bar and the, the torque demands at the joint and there's subsequent tension on the fiber and that tension is then causing the the cascade that mechanotransduction cascade that's leading to increase in the protein synthesis so when i i would argue or i would say like the best way to think of volume is you know define that is is an impulse um like high threshold fiber impulse. And it's not something we can neatly quantify in an Excel spreadsheet or anything, but um, you know, something that, that's conceptual on the physiological level anyway. Um, and when we look at that, you can see how it's like relative effort and intensity, that, that's going to get us on the board. That's gonna be, you know, bring our best players into the game, you know, off the bench, so to speak. And then the volume is like how much time we're actually playing those players in the game. Um, and so they're, they're both equally important, you know, in, if you play them for a short period of time, they're not going to have much effect, but if you don't play them at all, nothing's going to happen or, you know, the stimulus is going to be very suboptimal. So it, it's hard. It, I guess it's, it's erroneous to compare the two and say one versus the other, because they're both dependent on each other in order to, lead to that impulse stimulus on the fiber level. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Or is, is that, should I keep going? <laughs> no, 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 that was, um, that was good. And I guess, uh, yeah, we sort of define volume in a very basic set sense as a uh, number of hard working sets, you know, RP of six or more. Um, and that's what will essentially be the way that people are going to quantify volume in training. Yeah, in, in, in practice, hard sets is, is probably the best way. Um, and you, you think of that as just the, the vehicle that's carrying this this impulse stimulus, it's, you know, it's packaged into these hard sets that um, create sufficient um, recruitment and tension. So when it comes to hypertrophy, you know, the, the goal, you know, anytime we think of muscle growth, we think, you know, protein synthesis, you know, muscle protein synthesis has to exceed muscle protein breakdown. Like that, that is the, the ultimate goal on a physiological level that we're trying to, like, that's the end goal for us. So any, any training protocol, regardless of, you know, what it, what it looks like, that's what it's trying to do. Um, and when we train, you know, we, we increase basically our sensitivity to amino acid feeding. So we train, and if we were to train fasted and then not eat afterwards, um, you know, there, I, I think there's some research, depending on the protocol, um, this can differ a little bit, but generally muscle protein breakdown actually exceeds synthesis. So you see both of them increase in the absence of, of feeding post-exercise. But when you add feeding in post-exercise, you're augmenting the synthetic um, impact that that feeding would have on its own. So, you know, anytime we eat protein, we start synthesizing new muscle proteins, um, but there's also breakdown occurring in the background, and that's what protein turnover is. So when we, uh, when we train, you know, if, if we don't have protein afterwards, we're, we're we do increase that protein turnover rate because we are synthesizing new proteins, but a lot of it's coming from what we just broke down. So in the absence, like one, one of the, the main points I, I, I'm 
I'm trying to make is when it comes to overload, you know, a lot of people hinge their, their progress on what they're doing in the gym when it's just a small component or it's a very relevant component, but it, it's, it's only one part of the whole entire all encompassing strategy to tip the scales in favor of synthesis. So, you know, if, if you're, fo and this has a lot of implications for powerlifters too, because powerlifters are notorious for, you know, obsessing about the X's and O's of their programming, but not really, you know, giving a shit about their nutrition, you know? So it, it, it you need to make sure that you're supporting your, your, your training with and creating an, an environment. So you're actually taking advantage of that, you know, larger area under the curve for synthesis. Um, so when it comes to actual progressive overload, you know, the, the idea of overload, I mean, I think we've all heard the story of uh, Milo of Croton, the, the Greek wrestler that, you know, carried the calf until it was a, a bull. Um, and I think any time, like just the, the actual word progressive overload, it, it insinuates a progression in, in load, which a lot of people, um, you know, they, they, they assume that means, you know, weight, adding weight on the bar. And that's certainly a way to create overload. But one of, one of the things that I think people overlook with overload is, you know, whether you're progressing reps, whether you're progressing weight, adding sets, you know, decreasing rest and increasing, you know, the density of a training session. What you're ultimately doing is, when it comes to hypertrophy, is you're still increasing the protein synthetic response in some way. Okay, so anytime you uh, add weight, you're creating more tension stimulus on those fibers. Um, if you're adding reps, generally what's happening is you know, with, with overload, it, it's less about it's almost like we're, we have to keep pace with the rate that we adapt. So when we think of motor recruitment, um, you know, occur, say we maximize motor recruitment when we're, you know, at five reps in reserve on, um, just arbitrary number. Um, you know, as we progress, that, that landmark or that point of motor recruitment is going to, you know, gradually move and we have to keep performing and pushing our performance in order to maintain full muscle fiber recruitment. So overload isn't, it, it's not, I think people frame it as this, like, okay, we are this, this organism and we need to shock our system. So it, you know, freaks out, has this alarm phase, and then it has this super compensatory effect. When really it's, I mean, it is an adapt, adaptation. Hypertrophy is certainly an adaptation, but it's, um, you know, over, overload isn't something that, it, it's not a stressor that we're not already capable of doing, you know, it, it's something that we're already, like, that, that's within our capacity as an organism. It, it's not like a stressor that is, um, you know, outside, outside of our means to cope with. Um, but, you know, with, with, I think your um your exact quote. Oh, I'm gonna try not to butcher this. Was uh, your ability to add weight to the bar is an adaptive outcome from prior overload, not a requirement for subsequent overload. That was uh, a quote from one of your articles. I think. It was. Yeah. So yeah, and that's, I, I should have just said that. So, so yeah, the you know the yeah your ability to progress it's because what you've been doing prior to that has been working rather than it being, this is something I need to do now in order to continue to progress. Um, so like really what overload is when it comes to hypertrophy, it's performing enough work or a sufficient intensity of work to continue to be able to recruit that, that escalating threshold for fiber recruitment. That's really all it comes down to. And then accruing enough volume, um, in that state to, you know, tip the scales in favor of that synthetic side of things. So, um, so when you look at it that way, I mean, there, there's a lot of ways, like you could in theory, I mean, this isn't practical, but you could continue to, um, you know, just perform, say you had a hundred pounds on dumbbell bench 
and you know that was all you ever bought. <laughs> you, know, you, you have a basement gym, that's all you got. Um, you just go and you could just keep doing more and more reps with that and you would just gradually that overload threshold or that threshold for maximal fiber recruitment would increase and you would be forced to do more reps to keep pace with that. So, you know, that, that brings up another question um, as far as threshold, like the, the idea of an overload threshold, um, it, it insinuates that there's this, this level of work that we need to do before our body is like, okay, we need to bring in like these adaptive resources to cope with this. And that, that's not really how things work. Um, or an overload threshold can also be considered something that, you know, th this is a stressor that's outside of what we just did or what we are currently accustomed to. And when people think progressive overload, they often think, I need to do a little bit more than what I did the last time, you know, or, or beating the logbook. Otherwise, you know, it's not an quote unquote overloading session. So, um, when it comes to hypertrophy, you know, it, it's less about the work you're doing and more about, you know, the argument could be made is, is the overload threshold simply the point at which, you know, it's the amount of work that leads to synthesis exceeding breakdown. And when you think of it that way, you know, just the, the sheer fact that we have a range of adaptive volumes tells us like we, we could go, we could do, you know, we could escalate from two to four sets, you know, across a, a mesocycle and then back down to two. And that two could still be overloading in nature if we're operating off of that definition, because we could still be providing, we could still be in a net positive protein balance. Um, so protein balance isn't contingent upon us doing and beating the prior amount of work we had just done. Um, which is which is a key thing to to keep in mind with hypertrophy because really it's like you have to keep pace with um, you know the rate that you adapt and your ability to recruit these muscle fibers but you know the the, the rate that uh, it, it's not like protein synthesis and breakdown just immediately you know it, it doesn't rapidly change based off of what you just did if that makes sense yeah. Totally, totally. And I think you brought up a lot of good points there about how people generally hold the idea that in order to, you know, see any kind of growth, uh, they need to be doing more and they need to, you know, be able to quantify uh, that they're doing more um, to then be able to grow. And that might not necessarily be true when it comes to you know uh, achieving a net um, you know protein synthetic response, and if that is the case, um, you know I guess what is the best way um, for someone to go about progressing the stimulus uh, over the course of a mesocycle um, or their training career, and what is the means by which they should do that and try to measure that in some way because I think the the attractiveness of you know beating the logbook is that people can sort of you know hold their hat in their hand and say hey you know uh, I'm, I'm progressing so it's a it's a foolproof kind of means of ensuring that they're, they're getting some stimulus right um, so how can they then you know use that framework that you've just outlined to you know, progress things over time yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, your your performance is going to be going up. So I, I'm certainly not discounting the the importance of performance improvements. I'm just downplaying the importance of session to session or week to week changes in performance, um, or needing to do more than what you just did. Um, so that that's one you know clarification that I think is important to make. But when it comes to you know, how, how to progress, you know, I, I like to think of, of overload and, you know, progression almost is a, you know, a reactive approach and sort of a proactive approach. And what I mean by that is say you have a 
you know, across the mesocycle, you have the same amount of set volume. Like say you're doing 15 sets per body part, you know, for four straight weeks, um, or 15 sets per week per body part for four straight weeks. So if we're progressing in reps and say we're using like a, a double progression method, um, you know, like a dynamic double progression method that we've, we've talked about before. The Brian um, Minor double, dynamic double progression. DDP. DDP. Um, so the, uh, you know, if, if we're seeing progress, then we know overload is occurring. Okay. We, we know that like, we don't need to change anything. Um, and, and so if that's like, that's more of a reactive approach. And so, you know, using overload is a is a tool to assess the effectiveness of your volume dose. I think is something people could could learn from. Um, you know, if you're making progress, you you know you're somewhere in that adaptive range. Now, if you're like rather, and and there's going to be you know situations where it makes sense to escalate sets, but I would consider that more of like this is a more so a proactive approach where I'm trying to like I know I'm already providing an overload stimulus I know I'm above my minimum effective dose or minimum effective volume now I'm going to start adding sets is a is an attempt to accelerate the progress and you know I, I would personally take that more like on a week-to-week -week basis or even session to session I mean you know when you go into the gym what days you feel better than others. Um, and so, you know, you could almost auto-regulate your volume on a session to session basis, knowing like, okay, if I do three sets of this exercise from eight to 10, taking each one, you know, within one to two reps in reserve, I know, I know that's a sufficient enough stimulus for me, for my performance to trend in a positive direction over time. But if you feel great, you can be a bit more assertive. But one of the, the critiques I have of like an accumulation approach where you're adding sets every week because one, it, it's not required in uh, one, it's just simply not required in order to make progress because some people think, you know, you need to do more volume than you did the week prior because you adapt to that new level of volume. And we don't really adapt to the new level of volume like that. That's just, it's, it's, uh, you know, if that were the case, like if the same level of volume would no longer produce, like set volume would no longer produce the effects we're after, like what what does that tell us? Like it would tell us that either that same work is resulting in a lower protein synthetic response, that, that same number of set volumes, a lower synthetic response or muscle protein breakdown is all of a sudden much higher as a result. And, and that's like, in the short term, neither of those are the case. Like over the long term, there is some anabolic resistance to, to exercise and you may need to do some more sets. But, you know, I, I, I don't like, I, I shouldn't say I don't like, I, I just don't have it as my default where I um, accumulate volume across the training block. I, I try to take more of a reactive approach based off of, you know, that week's fatigue because if you if you're doing two sets in week one and then you know five sets in week five um or you know whatever if you're if you know two sets in week one um you know four sets a few weeks later that that's almost in order to fully take advantage of that it, it's assuming that your fatigue levels and your you know capacity recovery is going to be sufficient on those later weeks but you're going to be entering those weeks with more fatigue because if they're later in the block um, but also the demand is higher so what happens if you know in week four you have you know a, a high stress week at work or your sleep is crappy you know for whatever reason like you have to be pliable with your volume assignments on a given day because it may not be appropriate given your um you know, your ability to, to address that, that uh, stimulus. And, you know, I, I think the, I, I really like um, Dr. Mike and the concept of the, the MRV um, or the minimum effective 
um, volume and then the maximum recoverable. I think it's it, conceptual. It's, it's extremely beneficial for people to understand that. Um, and it's it makes a ton of sense. Um, but I do think that that range, like it shifts across a training career, but it also shifts within a day, you know, or from day to day. Like you can, you know, I mean, energy balance affects it. So you have to, to kind of account for everything when you're trying to, um, you know, pick your volume assignment, you know, within a, a given micro cycle. I mean, if you have a week where, say, you're in college and it's, um, you know, summer break and or fall break or whatever, and you have a week that you can just totally dedicate to to pushing things, but that week happens to be earlier in the block, then, you know, it, it's like, what would you, what is the harm in pushing a little harder there? You know, in, unless it's muscle damage. Um, you know, I, I would argue as long as you're you're able to push the amount of volume without accruing a ton of muscle damage, then on paper. So, um, so I to to answer your question, like that, it's a with a dynamic double progression and adding and what we mean by that is it's double progression, but on a set to set basis. So, you know, you have your rep range, three sets of we'll say eight to 12 and each week you're progressing, you know, each set individually. If you're able to hit the top end of a rep range on any given set, if that RPE, then you would increase weight the following week. Um, and so what that does for bodybuilding purposes, it's nice because it ensures that we're, we're getting high levels of motor recruitment on a set to set basis. Whereas like standard double progression, we may not be accomplishing that we may be either progressing at a rate that is a lot slower than we can handle, or it could be you know, more assertive than we can handle. So it, it's more of an auto regulatory way of progressing the stimulus based off of what you're capable of on that given day. Um, and then the following week, you know, you still work up to that same relative effort, same, you know, one to two reps in reserve, and you try to build off of the week prior, but you let that progress come to you. All you have to worry about is lifting the weight that's listed until you only have a couple reps in the tank, then take a step back and see like, okay, how does this compare to the week prior or the, you know, a few weeks prior and collect data and determine if things are trending up, like you're good. Like, you, you know, you're in that range. If they're not, you can add a little bit of volume. Um, but just, it, you, you don't have to add volume every single week. Yeah, no, I, think that uh, yeah based on our prior discussions we've sort of uh, both agreed that um, you know that there's an appropriate amount of volume that will see that adaptation and then once you are getting that like you're, you're pretty much uh, home and hosed um, and you, you keep it there for as, as long as you can um, and in terms of the rate of adaptation um, and progression that people will see how will this differ across the different time courses of somebody's, you know, training career um, as they become more advanced and, you know, get closer to their genetic ceiling? Um, so for, we'll start with beginners, you know, how quickly should beginners see this uh, rate of progression and structure, um, you know, overload within a cycle and then we can move on to intermediates and then advanced yeah, I mean, there, there's going to be exceptions to all of this, but, you know, I would say most beginners, you know, they can add weight pretty, you know, raw, raw beginners can can add weight almost session to session or, or every other session, you know, keeping all else equal. And what I mean by that is like rep range and relative effort. So think, you know, whatever arbitrary rep and RPE pairing that you're thinking of, then, you know, every session or every other session, that should be you know, you should require more weight to get there. Um, and it, if not that, you would probably at least be seeing, you know, a greater amount of reps at a given load. Some type of progression should be occurring. 
um, almost every session, I think, with, with a true novice. Um, you know, there's just a lot of, of neurological adaptations that, that haven't occurred yet that are probably going to occur before um, you, know, you see significant hypertrophy. Um, when it comes to, you know, intermediates, it's, it's probably, you know, I, I would say the, the load progression isn't going to happen every week. Um, you know, I'd say every two to four weeks. Um, but you should still be seeing rep progressions at a given load. I mean, think of those as like that, that's a small incremental increase. You know, we, we can progress reps, we can progress weight. You know, progressing weight at a given number of reps, that's going to take a, a large degree of adaptation um, to go up five pounds, keeping all else equal, whereas performing an additional rep is, I mean, it's a, a smaller relative increase in performance. Um, so I think for intermediates, yeah, you, you can probably look and think, um, you know, every two to four weeks, you're increasing weight. Um, you know, certainly every every mesocycle, you're, you're going to be seeing increases in your lifts. Um, and then for advanced athletes, I mean, you know, I, when it comes to, to powerlifters, especially, I mean, there's, you know, highly advanced powerlifters, you know, you may be gaining two and a half to seven and a half kilos on a lift in a year, you know, it, it progress can, can really slow down. Um, and muscle growth can really slow down with experience. And, the, the the main you know there's there's a few reasons for that one you know that it, it's it takes more effort to to keep pace with that you know escalate like the whole need to overload like we talked about is to to keep chasing that overload fresh that that recruitment threshold um because as we get stronger that ceiling for recruitment is going to grow and get higher and we need to keep up with it in order to continue to recruit the high threshold fibers so you know, that aspect is, you know, you're going to have to progressively go heavier and heavier or do more and more reps in order to get there. But also, you know, it is individuals um, age, there's, there's a decrease in um, like the, the protein synthetic response to feeding. Um, so, and, and I'm not sure if there's research looking at like trained versus untrained on this, like is in like younger populations, but I know in, in older populations, we know there's a mechanism by which there's, there's some down regulation in, um, you know, anabolic pathways with either experience and or age. And we know that when it comes to protein intake in older populations, a lot of that um, that blunted response can be offset with a, a greater amount of protein per meal. So, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind. You know, I would say even as, as training age starts to increase is, is you may need, um, and again, I'm not sure if there's data, data looking at like younger populations in this regard, but I guess it wouldn't surprise me if the mechanism was similar um, where, you know, perhaps you need more protein to elicit the same magnitude of response. Um, and also you may need a greater overall impulse in order to achieve the same, you know, degree of, like there, there's there's a diminished synthetic response for each, you know, unit of impulse that you provide. Um, and so I think that that's one reason why, um, you know, with, with training age, you hear, you hear the, statement you know you're going to need to do more volume over time um, and the problem i have with that is like volume can be defined a number of ways and in some cases that's not true um, but in other cases in terms of like the actual like we're looking at impulse is the the way to conceptualize that and absolutely you're going to absolutely need to provide a greater impulse over time in order to continue to progress so you know you may have to do um you know, more sets because your, your rate of, uh, of adaptation is going to be so slow that you, you may not be able to progress reps. You may not be able to progress load, um, you know, on a week to week basis. And if you start to plateau and you're not able to progress anything, you know, across like a mesocycle, then you're probably going to need to do more sets in order to accommodate that. So I, I would say, I mean, think of like adding sets is, that's like your cannon for adding volume. You know, it's like you can kind of 
micro dose your your tension stimulus with added weight on the bar or added reps keeping all else equal but when you add a set like you're adding both you know like you're you're adding a greater um you know just overall you know bolus of tension into into the mix so um so i would say yeah as, as you as you progress in training age you're I think early on, you don't really need to be worried about adding sets as much. Um, you could probably get away with, you know, a pretty narrow window there. And I've even seen, you know, pretty advanced athletes, like just as a coach, I, I can't say with, with honesty that I've seen radically shifting ranges of effective volumes across a training career. Like in, in maybe you can speak to that as well, Jacob, but like say somebody's, you know, their, their minimum effective volume and their maximum, like, yes, it is going to shift, but it's not like, okay, their, their MRV was once, you know, 10 sets and now it's 30, you know, it, it's not like I, you never see huge, or at least I, I haven't seen huge swings like that. Um, but I think you could offset some of that decline in the rate of adaptation by doing more set, you know, more set volume as you go, simply because you're you're going to need that to provide to offset the inefficiency in the synthetic response to an existing impulse. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. I I haven't seen wild differences in someone's like volume ranges as they've progressed from like early intermediate to late intermediate or an early advanced. Um, you know, I, I only work with, I dare say, maybe three or four truly, like truly advanced lifters. Like, you know, they'd be lucky to build, you know, a couple hundred grams of, of, of tissue, you know, a year. Like the, these people are just, yeah jacked as um you know and in terms of their strength like they're adding a couple of kilos to their total every six to 12 months um and and the volumes aren't necessarily that different um i think there's other ways that uh you progress things um you know outside of you know set volume alone uh you know for those kind of people um but yeah, I definitely think that as we discussed for hypertrophy, um, you know, over time, it's it's more a case of exposure to the stimulus and just like keeping that exposure there, um, you know, for long periods because uh, muscle growth takes a lot of time and it's a very different um, adaptation to the neurological stuff, um, which I think doesn't get enough attention. So do you maybe want to talk about uh, that and how that sort of plays into, you know, progressing the stimulus um, with hypertrophy, how, you know, we sort of need to balance, you know, getting overloads, uh, you know, per se, um, but not at the cost of our ability to, you know, sustain a decent amount of stimulus. For example, if we, you know, had this really aggressive, um, you know, assumed set progression of like adding a set um, or a few sets per week over the course of mesocycle, that would lead to quite a significant, you know, build up in fatigue. You probably need to deload, you know, every four to six weeks, um, you know, and if you have to deload so frequently all the time, that could come at the cost of like, you know, getting more stimulus, right? Like if you're deloading every fifth week within a year, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I don't, there's what, five, six weeks in a year yeah. thereabouts. Um, that you're not getting some stimulus, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but, um, you know, just for argument's sake, you know, there could be a case for, um, you know, more auto-regulation um, and keeping the stimulus where you can and only sort of pulling back when needed for certain muscle groups or certain lifts, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get what you're so – I'm not sure what the exact question is, but I, I think I, yeah. I know what you're saying. Um, so the uh, – you know, when it comes to that example that you gave, like deloading more frequently, um, you know, when we, when we look at that in isolation, that question, or just on the surface, it, it, it seems like, yeah, if you're having to deload more frequently, that's going to be disadvantageous. But 
it is also admittedly kind of ignoring the the magnet you know the increased magnitude of response you're getting on those other weeks um and there's certainly a point of diminishing returns within within a session um and you know james krieger has you know done some um, data analysis that's demonstrated that that there's that inverted u relationship in terms of set volume within a session um and you know but if you if you're like grossly exceeding that um and you're operating a kind of on the right side of that curve, then yeah, I would dial back for the sake of getting the block duration a bit longer. Um, but if everything is is working and you're progressing week to week, um, but you do find you're having to deload relatively frequently, then like I, you could just be somebody who just accrues fatigue quickly. You know, it, it's um, like we we look at the like the time course for adaptation when it comes to, to hypertrophy. And, you know, the protein synthesis in response to training can be elevated for anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. Um, so it is a relatively acute window where we're actually building new muscle after a training session. So I think the case can be made, like, I, at least I know for me, like, I'll, I'll know you know, a week in advance or a few days in advance if if the coming days are going to be more stressful than others. I mean, there, there's going to be times where things sneak up on you and your volume tolerance for that day may go down. But I think you can almost get away with planning your volume on a week-to-week -week basis based off of your, you know, acute capacity to, to cope with those stressors for that week. Like if you know you're on vacation, like I said, you you, you don't have to like you can push it a little bit that week. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing that, you know, when it, when it comes to progressing volume and getting more assertive, before, and this, this comes full circle with what I was going to say, you know, what I've been, the point about, you know, optimizing your protein intake. It's like if, if you're not optimizing the little things to take advantage of your current level of volume, then you need to address those before, like I, I would certainly advise addressing those before you add more volume. So if, if sleep is, you know, very suboptimal, your protein intake is, you know, below triple digits and, um, or quality of your protein intake is really low. It's like all of that has a, a profound impact on that overall balance, just like your training volume does. So, you know, Get what you can out of each level of volume before you you add more, uh, because you may find that you know a a lower volume threshold with better behaviors, you know eating and sleeping behaviors is going to lead to a better outcome than higher volumes with suboptimal behaviors. Um, and I know I, I went off on a bit of a tangent there <laughs> what you were saying, but ultimately, yeah, I don't think you need to you don't need to be too concerned about um, you know, in, in practice, like if, if you're having to deload every third week or something, then yeah, you're probably pushing too hard and you're probably accruing a ton of muscle damage in the process. Um, and I think that that's ultimately, you know, as more research comes out, it, it seems to be, you know, controlling muscle damage can really be the, the key to, um, you know, keeping progress, you know, coming. And that's, uh, you know, when we have high degrees of muscle damage, central fatigue is elevated. And when central fatigue is elevated, it's like we can't really even access those those high threshold fibers. So we, we can't even achieve the objective we're trying to achieve with overload anyway, if, if we're, you know, have high amounts of central fatigue. So, um, you know, as, as long as you're able to, you know, recover and replicate at least your baseline performance, then I think you're you're safe to keep pushing a block um, unless you have like joint discomfort, and that's the other thing is like you you have to account for you know the the weakest link in the chain when it comes to all of this, and you know is is I think most coaches can attest. I mean it's mo most athletes they they hit a wall because they get hurt before it, it's a volume you know, tolerance issue. It's like, I just don't, you know, very rarely do I have somebody who's, 
you know, they, they just simply don't have enough time in the day to, to progress anymore. It, it's usually like, okay, my knee hurts and I can only do, you know, three sets of squats as opposed to five, um, or I can't squat at all type of thing. So, you know, making sure that you're, um, you know, accounting for just health and connective tissue integrity across, you know, an entire training career and taking a wider lens approach to your volume outside of simply, you know, what is going to create the largest stimulus for adaptation. That, that's going to be important for maximizing long-term outcomes, which I think is probably more what you actually asked originally. Yeah. So, yeah, totally. And uh, I guess that, yeah, I wasn't really asking um, a question as much as I was bringing attention to the point of getting exposure in the muscle tissue, you know, to that tension uh, is the fundamental goal. And if we're doing things that are sort of uh, decreasing unnecessarily um, our exposure to that tension, it's probably not a wise idea. And, you know, the time course for, you know, hypertrophy um, is, yeah, in an acute sense, MPS is quite, you know, a short, um, you know, response to training, but the actual process of, you know, building tissue uh, takes a long time, um, meaning that it, it's just a matter of getting in there and doing, you know, training for a long period of showing time, up. Yeah. showing up. Yeah. Um, and I guess, yeah, more to the point that you brought up at the end, um, what a lot of people don't realize is that there are multiple different, you know, biological systems that we stress when we train, not just muscle. Like that's a really... Um, you know, narrow side, narrow sided, um, you know, view to look at things, you know, we have, uh, you know, the nervous system, we have our joints and, and often those can be, uh, you know, limiting factors in our ability to, you know, get the tension uh, that we need on the muscle. Um, and in terms of how we then piece together, um, you know, mesocycles across the board, um, you know, do you, think that changing the approach um, for progressing the stimulus um, will differ when we have different goals, for example. Um, you know, if somebody wants to do a specialization phase um, or if they want to, um, you know, downregulate their training because it's no longer a priority, like how do you then think people should go about it if their, um, you know, circumstances or goals are changing? Yeah, well, with with the goals, I mean, the nice thing about hypertrophy is it's a very forgiving goal in that it's not highly specific to any one variable. Um, and what I mean by that is, is you know, we, we can progress off of, you know, depending on the rate at which you progress off of a pretty wide range of volumes. Um, and with intensity, we know, you know, over the last five years that we can grow across any intensity range. So when we're talking strictly increasing skeletal muscle, there, there are a lot of ways to go about accomplishing that. And I look, you know, as a coach, I look a lot at, at just client preferences um, and, and what they enjoy doing. And honestly, a lot of the adjustments I make are simply to spice things up and make it fun for the athlete when it comes to hypertrophy training. Um, because there, there are so many different avenues to that tension outcome. Um, and now like that being said, I mean, if, if metabolic stress plays a role, um, you know, a, a separate causal role, like it, it's not going to hurt to include some metabolically taxing work. Like it's not going to like, there's just because it may not play a causal role doesn't mean you should avoid it, you know? Um, but with different goals, like if, if strength was a goal, for example, um, you know, a lot of the, the adaptations from, you know, strength training, pure strength training are, you know, dependent on increase in, in load. Um, so, you know, doing an extra rep with the same load is like you you will want to make increasing load like the, the forefront of your strategy if you're trying to maximize strength and that's both from um 
you know, a, a coordination standpoint, um, you know, tendon stiffness, you know, the just intramuscular coordination. Uh, you know, we know that movements are motor patterns are very specific to the intensity that they're trained in. Um, so like, yeah, you strength outcomes, you definitely want to sort of bias the, the load increase. Whereas hypertrophy, you may get away with, you know, oftentimes like, oh, I'll use a pretty wide rep range for somebody. I'll say, you know, if somebody's joints are, are bothering them, I may say, you know, four sets of six to 15, you know, where, I want them to start aiming for the high end, but you know they can keep the load the same in, unless fatigue drops to the point where they get below like six reps on the set, and then they would decrease the load. Um, but doing that, it, it allows them to you know use a more submaximal load, but still still achieve high amounts of mechanical tension on the fiber level. So. Um, you know, based on, I, you know, in terms of the overall progression strategy, I look a lot at, um, you know, obviously their, their goal, if they have a strength focused goal, then, you know, I, I include something within the micro cycle, you know, at least one day where we're progressing load session to session. Um, and that doesn't mean it's at the same RPE, like it can be, you know, we're working up in relative intensity across the mesocycle. Um, but when it's, you know, somebody who's, you know, a little bit older, um, their joints are achier, then I, you know, I'll, I'll really drive that, that rep progression um, a bit harder and, and set progression more so than, than load. Um, so you really have to do kind of like a needs analysis of, of the individual um, and, and see what their needs and constraints are and and then formulate your your strategy i mean there's there's not going to be any absolutes um but again like there, there doesn't uh there doesn't need to be just because I mean, hypertrophy like i said is just so flexible in how you can achieve that outcome yeah yeah perfect and with that in mind um i guess do you want to wrap things up with a bit of a discussion of why incorporating a, you know broad spectrum of rep ranges can be beneficial um, and some of the potential drawbacks um, of training in you know the low end high end uh, rep ranges when it comes to progressing the stimulus yeah um, well one I, I think there's even if there's not definitive evidence that undulating intensity and rep range is more advantageous, just simply the, the fact that behaviorally people don't like doing the same thing over and over again, I mean, that, that's reason enough to vary the stimulus. It's also reason enough to vary the stimulus if there is a chance that varying it is, is going to be more beneficial. Because we know, like, our... If, if the main objective is mechanical tension and, you know, we're talking on, you know, fiber level there, which is important to distinguish because oftentimes people associate mechanical tension simply with heavy weights when really it's, you know, the amount of tension, those high threshold fibers are shouldering in proportion to the actual demand in, in higher rep ranges. They're, they're shouldering a large percentage of that as you approach failure. So, um, so yeah, we, we know we're achieving the objective regardless of rep range. So it's like, why not vary it, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, situations where you probably want to, uh, you know, bias the higher end of that range is you know, joint integrity. Um, you know, I think also time, you know, even though higher rep ranges, I mean, each set takes a longer amount of time. Like they're also very conducive to things like cluster work. Um, and, you know, I know I, I rely heavily, especially for isolation movements on clusters and drop sets, just otherwise that work wouldn't get accomplished. Um, and then even if you aren't constrained by time and you want to take advantage of those intensity techniques, it's like you, if you're comparing one protocol to another, like say, say we knew drop sets were slightly 
less optimal than straight sets, which they appear to be equivalent. They don't seem to offer any added benefit as long as, or added, uh, yeah, benefit over straight sets. Um, but it, it does seem that you have to do a little bit more set volume to equate whatever you get on straight sets. So, um, but but say it was suboptimal, like you could still just be the sheer fact that it's saving you time is going to allow you to do you could do two sets of drop sets and and end up in a better spot. So I guess like rather than looking at things, comparing one thing to another and deciding you know in isolation, look at how much volume like will this tool help me within the session as a whole progress that tension stimulus? And if the answer is yes, then it's, it's a viable option. And for a lot of populations that, you know, have joint discomfort or are limited by time, higher rep ranges are extremely beneficial. Um, and then the other thing is with experience, you know, as training age progresses, it's harder to, you know, progress is going to come slower. I mean, we, we've talked, talked about that quite a bit in this. And, um, you know, one nice thing about the higher rep ranges is each unit of increase is a smaller percentage of the overall like load. So, um, you know, an, an added rep on a set of 15 is a smaller strength increase than an added rep on a set of six, you know. So, so you can, if you are motivated by, you know, numbers and, and seeing progression, it, it's nice because you can, like as an advanced athlete, still see progression almost every session if your load is, you know, 15 and above. Um, at least I, I found that myself. And then if the athlete has strength goals, obviously you're going to want to incorporate some, some lower rep work in there. Um, but you want to make sure, you know, even with power lifters, like one area that I'm really interested in is, you know, how much high intensity work you know, we'll define that as work over like 80%. Like how much volume of that work is required to optimize the adaptations that come with it or to maximize those? Like there's going to be a point of diminishing returns there as well. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if that number is pretty low, like say, say you know, and it's sure, certainly gonna be variable on the individual, um, but if you can, operate with submaximal volumes more often and just provide enough high intensity exposure to you know reap the maximal benefits from it then why, why wouldn't you do that you know it, it's going to be better more than likely better for hypertrophy assuming um, you can accrue more set volume with the higher intensities or the i'm sorry the lower intensities and it's going to keep your joints more than likely in, in better shape um, so yeah, that that's an area. I mean, we've we've looked at hypertrophy a lot and discussed hypertrophy a lot here, but you know, the the dosing of high intensity work is an area of research that that seems like there's still a lot to be uncovered there um, when it comes to optimization. And you know, I think that that is going to help us uncover you know the the best ways to undulate within a micro cycle and and optimize that. Um, but I'd say for most people. You know, I, I will generally inc include at least two different rep ranges within a microcycle, um, just for variety. You know, that 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 alone is reason enough. But there, there could be some additional benefits as well that are worth their implementation. Awesome, awesome. So, Brian, where can the guys find you to follow along uh, your work and uh obviously learn more from you where can they find you um i am on instagram um at bd minor and i have a website uh, myojournal.com it's myo for journal um and then i work with jacob on the jps mentorship program and um, that's getting ready to launch the second round in september September yeah. and then I, I will be at the uh, UEBC at the end of the month um, with an awesome lineup of, of guests that I'm eager to, to learn from as well. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, not a problem, man. And uh, the contest prep course as well. You put together some wicked presentations on, uh, yeah, program design, cardio, uh, and adjustments uh, in, in contest prep. So thank you very much, Brian, for coming on. Man, yeah. 
it was uh, very good to chat to you as always, and we'll speak to you next time.